Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Parakala Prabhagar, the eminent political economist, a social critic, and uh, as described by Sanjay Baru, a Renaissance man. So welcome, Dr. Parakala. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Parakala will be sharing with us his views on the current uh, political social developments. And of course, uh, he will speak about his book, The Crooked Timber of New India, Essays on a Republic in Crisis. So welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me here. In fact, uh, in your book, you have stated that you have been following the speeches of the Prime Minister from the Red Fort for quite a few years, you know. And you have been a keen observer of the Indian politics. And you have made it very clear that uh, when Modi began his first speech in 2014, it was all about development, all about inclusion. And now you have listened to his 10th independence speech, I think, from the ramparts of uh, uh, Red Fort. So how you see the evolution and uh, what messages uh, you have drawn out of his latest uh, speech from Red Fort? You see, when uh, this whole thing has started, uh, slightly before 2014, 2014 elections, uh, the Bharati Janata Party, its leadership, and the then uh, Prime Minister candidate, they did not talk about uh, communalism, divide, um, the othering of uh, minorities. Um, that was not on the agenda. The agenda that time, as told to the nation, during the campaign speeches, as well as from the Rampart Separate Food, as you mentioned in his uh, Independence Day addresses to the nation, they were of development, fight against poverty, unemployment, making India, you know, a developed country. Uh, you know, that was the very secular kind of a developmental agenda that was given to the nation. And that reflected in the initial speeches of the Prime Minister from the Red Fort. Yes. In fact, if you go back, the first ever speech, immediately after he became the Prime Minister, he became Prime Minister in May and the August, the first uh, uh, speech from the Red Fort, uh, Independence Day speech, uh, it acknowledged all the previous Prime Ministers. Yes. All the Chief Ministers. Everybody, every political party. And uh, the Prime Minister then told us that, uh, you know, it's a collective effort. It's Team India. Team India and immediately after that there was a Niti Aayog meeting with yeah. all the Chief Ministers. Right. And he projected Team India as Prime Minister and all the Chief Ministers. Yes. Now, I don't have to tell you what the situation today mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, forget Jawaharlal Nehru and other Prime Ministers, uh, you know, Moraji Bhai and uh, Lal Badru Shastri, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, Charan Singh, you know, Chandrasekhar, forget them. Even the tallest leader of his own party, Adal Bihari Vajpayee, Adal Bihari Vajpayee he is also not mentioned at all. Yes. He is also not recognized. It is a, a very strange kind of a thing where he and the 140 uh, crore people, that is Team India. Yes. And, and 140 crore people are notional, of course. Team India is, you know, probably Ek Akela. That is the kind of scenario we have. If you give me one more minute, I'd like to draw your attention or remind you of a very important speech during the campaign that the present Prime Minister, when he was Prime Ministerial candidate, uh, made. In 2013? 
or two thousand during the campaign during yeah, the yeah. campaign two thousand fourteen yeah he said the fight is not between Hindus and Muslims yes the fight is between Hindus and Muslims on the one side right. as a team yes 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 together together against unemployment against poverty corruption against corruption yes against price rise right 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 yeah so that was the original pitch uh, when we uh, go ahead talking yeah. i'll tell you what kind of a transition has taken place and how it has taken place and why probably it has taken right. place you know my hypothesis yes yes we yes. can talk about yes. that this is the very marked kind of a thing that we notice you know the the very clear shift from 2014 say after 2016 or so right and during his speech i think prime minister modi made an announcement that uh, he will come back again to red fort next year oh, and list the latest, out the yeah, latest one the latest speech yeah. that he will list out the achievements of his regime and he will address the nation again from the ramparts of the red fort don't you think that it was a kind of uh, announcement that he will be the prime ministerial candidate uh, once again and the surprising element uh, may, maybe it, it's not that surprising is that uh, both rss and bjp you know they always claim to project uh, institutions organizations not individuals but here the prime minister himself is making the announcement that he will be the next pm again so how do you look at that oh but you see uh, talking about institutions processes not individuals you know all that is what given a go by it, it it doesn't hold any more today uh, you know the, the kind of uh, um, individuality the kind of projection of individuals that is happening today um is i think uh, to my mind unprecedented yeah um we had that kind of a thing during mrs indira gandhi but compared to this that that looks very amateurish this is something which is very professional which is uh, very deliberate very cultivated use of uh, high technology and all the means of mass communication right um you know this has taken the whole thing to a, a different kind of a level yeah it it is a known fact that uh, prime minister modi is the unquestioned unchallenged leader within his party bjp there is uh, no one to question him there is no one to challenge him but uh, has he taken over rss too you see i am not very competent to comment on uh, you know the equation between uh, bjp and the rss i i do not know much uh, but it looks as you said it looks that um, you know the the entire organization of the party the entire organization or a plethora of organizations which are associated with bjp in some form or the other uh, they have given into this kind of a, a narrative mm 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 it looks like that but i do not know i am not very competent to uh, make a remark on what are their internal relationships and uh, equations etc right but it seems that uh, as of now prime minister modi is in total command i think uh, from uh, from a, a journalistic point from of view from what appears uh, from his speech yeah mm -hmm. probably yes yes and i would like to draw your attention to a paragraph uh, in your book Uh, i think uh, it is there uh, in the uh, acknowledgments uh, uh, let me see not acknowledgments but in the introduction i think yeah uh, let me let me just uh, go through that and uh, you conclude your introduction you know with these uh, with this anecdote uh, from uh, the film gladiator hmm? and uh, you are uh, speaking on uh, a conversation between two senators and the senator two i will i just caught uh, his word this is from the film gladiator two senators are speaking and uh, 
I am quoting about Caesar. Yeah, about Caesar. I am quoting a senator too. I think he knows what wrong is. Wrong is the more. Conjure magic for them and they will be distracted. Take away their freedom and still they will roar. The beating heart of Rome is not the marble of the Senate. It is the sand of the Colosseum. He will bring them death and they will love him for that. Do you think uh, the, the, the same process, you know, getting repeated in contemporary India? After, since you wrote this book, I think there have been many dramatic, interesting, intriguing developments across the nation. And uh, we know how BJP is now taking up one nation, one election, then the uniform civil court. As you have uh, uh, indicated, uh, they are conjuring magic. Uh, they are, these are distractions that BJP is planning uh, to divert the attention. Uh, so what is your conclusion? The very reason that I mentioned that uh, conversation between two senators about Caesar is to draw a parallel of what is happening today in our country. Uh, Johnny, just remember, if we had demonetization. Yeah. And uh, it put a huge amount of uh, uh, burden on vast majority of the nation. People queued up and they thought, you know, they were doing this kind of, they were undergoing this trouble in order to achieve a, a greater goal, you know, against uh, black money, terror funding, etc. Right. Et that's what we were given to believe. That, that's what the government uh, and the Prime Minister especially went on telling us. And he, uh, there was a dramatic uh, uh, speech of the Prime Minister where he said, give me 50 days, you know, otherwise you can just hang me or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but eventually what happened? Eventually almost every rupee has returned, barring a few. Yeah. A few lakhs. And the amount of cash that is in circulation has actually gone up. <laughs> no doubt, the, the digital transactions have also gone, gone up, but the cash transactions have also gone up. So, it, and you know, anybody who knows Economics 101, you know, the basic one, they will know that black money is not hoarded in cash. Yes. You know, if you have taken a bribe yesterday or day before, a week ago, probably it's still in cash. Otherwise, either it is in gold or it is in buildings or it is in lands or investments, etc., etc. You know what. So, what did you achieve? Almost everything has returned. Cash transactions have really gone up. Why did we put ourselves to so much of a trouble? Why did they? And, and the unorganized sector, which is a predominant sector in our economy, yes. has completely collapsed even today. It has not regained its pre-demonetization position. And immediately after that, you had pandemic, lockdowns, etc. Right. So, the economy, especially the unorganized sector, has not recovered. In spite of that, that is one. And during the pandemic, you have seen thousands of migrant laborers from Kerala walking all the way to, you know, Uttar Pradesh, from Punjab, people walking to Bihar. You have seen all yeah. that kind of a thing. Um, and, you know, you hundreds and hundreds of deaths, maybe thousands of deaths or right. more than that. Uh, because of uh, lack of oxygen, because of lack of bl um, right. beds and hospital facilities, you know, ventilators and vaccinations, medicines. You, you, we've seen that, all that. In spite of all these hardships, if the government is still holding and even able to win some elections, for instance, yeah. you know, even in spite of hundreds of dead bodies, 
floating in the holy Ganga. You had the UP BJP government returning to power. Yeah, after demonetization, uh, they won the UP election. Yes. And after the COVID crisis, they won again the UP election. So, which means that the that the common person in our country is very successfully distracted from the core issues of price rise, unemployment, inefficient delivery of public and government mm -hmm. services, mm -hmm. vaccination failure, demonetization right. and all that. Therefore, this government and the ruling party probably knows that, you know, these issues of economy, these issues of public services, you know, governance, etc., they don't really matter to them. You and I might, you know, go on shouting about, look, mm -hmm. look at the inflation, look at unemployment, mm -hmm. look at youth unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, look at uh, our, uh, foreign uh, uh, currency reserves, look at uh, Chinese occupation of our territory and all that. But they are appealing and very consciously, I feel, they are appealing very deliberately to the base instincts that swim under the surface of our stratified Indian polity and society. Right. And they are summoning those evil forces. They are summoning those dark forces. Mm -hmm. They are summoning those hate forces, hateful forces. That is the reason why, you know, the government or anybody responsible in the government, prime minister up to, you know, even a minister or the chief minister or... A, Right. You know, and a member of parliament, they won't say a word against, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, Dharma Sansad, yeah. where calls of ethnic cleansing, dog whistles, mm -hmm. dog whistles, and, uh, you know, uh, um, economic boycott, yeah. all such things. No. And, you know, for instance, we have uh, a member of parliament who heads a sports federation. Mm -hmm. Who is accused by, you know, yeah. uh, women right, right. of, um, of uh, you know, misbehaving. And of international repute. Of they won yes. uh, medals for India. Yeah. And that doesn't move. Even female ministers in the government, members of parliament in the ruling party, who are otherwise very vocal, who are otherwise very strong for people, even they don't talk. Their voices are also silenced. Why? Yeah. And here is the number. For all these, this dispensation and this government is not punished. <laughs> Any other government with this kind of an inflation, with this kind of unemployment, with this kind of a mishandling of COVID, with this kind of a mishandling of uh, you know demonetization um, and delivery of public services. Um, foreign power occupying uh, a large parcel of our land, it would have just collapsed. Yeah. It would have just gone. Right, right. And you know, kind of allegations that are coming about, yes, you know, yes, yes. about, uh, about a, a huge corporate entity and the, and the nexus between the corporate entity and the, and the, and the um, powers that be. Yeah. But amidst any, any other government, any other political party would have just collapsed. Yeah. This is not collapsing, this has not collapsed yet now, mainly because of, you know, the attention is diverted and very dark forces from the society are being summoned. But amidst all these criticisms, you know, the government is going ahead and uh, they claim that there is real progress uh, in India. And they point out that uh, more and more companies are coming, manufacturing sector, you know, it is gaining momentum. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the claim about India becoming a five trillion economy. So all these things are projected. And the message that is being sent across is that, uh, you know, it reminds us of the, the, of the slogan, you know, raised by the Vajpayee regime, that India is shining. But inequality, that is also growing. So this dichotomy between uh, the words and delivery, walking the talk, that has become 
the new phenomenon you know the gap between the word and delivery the word and deed has that become the hallmark of this regime as i pointed out the present regime is not making itself accountable on those points of delivery on those points of economic growth or development yeah they're just saying it all right you dispute that but you know your your, your attention is to to dispute them to engage them in that but you see away from the limelight of debates the real work is here mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you know you are summoning the hate mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you are creating division mm-hmm. uh, you are telling the majority community that you know you are the majority community it should be uh, a hindu rashtra all right ha huh. so this is what is happening but you see as a person i would like india to be strong i would like india to be you know a, a, a very strong economy uh, creating jobs uh, i'll be very proud if uh, you know not only i am the um, you know fastest growing economy right. but if i am also you know second or third or fourth in in per capita income i'm 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 not very excited about uh being a fifth largest economy with 100 140 crore people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and comparing myself with 5 crore or 6 crore economies mm-hmm. with population mm-hmm. i want my country to be not 148th in per capita income but 6th 7th 3rd 4th in per capita income right and you see you you pointed out that you know the lots of startups coming etc mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. yes um johnny in 2014 we had about roughly 125 billionaires in our country today there are 145 billionaires in our country right am i proud well i would have been proud with 145 billionaires in our in my country up from 125 if if my people are not so economically unequal where you know about 100 rich people own more than 800 billion in the economy and a large section of our population is thrown into poverty and declining incomes and if my economy doesn't have the highest youth unemployment one of the highest youth unemployment is in india right and if my country doesn't have 30% of the world's malnourished children if it doesn't have and if almost about 25 to 30% of the people who have been pushed below poverty line mm-hmm. do not come from india right if these things are also happening along with you know growth in in in, in startups and growth in billionaires etc i would have been very happy but that's not happening right. so you need to choose what do you want to look at right are you are you willing only to look at the growth in the number of billionaires and stop at that or are you also willing to look at the kind of inequalities that we have today in our economy we have to make a choice you have described uh, prime minister modi as staggeringly incompetent not only in the field of economy but uh, in almost all sectors but you see the prime minister was given a rousing reception yesterday by his followers in delhi for conducting the g20 meet uh, successfully they claimed that uh, it was a grand success and the point out that the world leaders leaders from across the world 
they are respecting prime minister modi they are lauding his achievements and uh, the g20 summit uh, has been a spectacular example of the image for his uh, you know the vishu guru image of um, mr modi do do you do you concur with this uh, see uh, india is respected when india is respected anybody who represents india even if it is johnny will also be respected and i would like my india to be respected in, in any any forum not only g20 g20 we have conducted and we have given the baton off to brazil and next year it's going to be brazil See, it is not a question of just marketing it is not a question of using an occasion to market oneself or to project oneself it's not that that is right we have done well and uh, we are at a high table we should be at a high table and we 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 should be you know if if we really you know um, solve our uh, economic inequalities and um, you know uh, see that our uh, our democratic backsliding stops and we we are more and more democratic you know if, if these things are also there we will we'll be happy but the point is this uh, johnny if you hold a reception in your own party office and tell me that it was a rousing reception you see probably you would have got a rousing reception if you had gone out to the streets equally rousing but by make it a, a stage managed show who are you trying to impress why do you want to impress you know for instance so many so many countries have participated you go and look into the internet i don't think any leader had gone back to a huge, huge reception they don't do that kind of a thing if you are self confident you don't need people to be brought in bust in and thrown flowers at you we've seen that in karnataka what happened so i have a feeling johnny that mm-hmm. if you if you are keen on stage managing these it only reveals some sort of a lack of self confidence i look at you know what what is the rate of unemployment what is the rate of inflation especially what is food inflation and how much are we manufacturing you know uh, if if somebody comes and tells me that look our growth rate is 7.2 or 6.5 or 6.8 then i would immediately try and break it down into you know which sector contributed how much how much mm-hmm. did agriculture contribute how much did uh, um, government services contribute how much did manufacturing contribute how much did uh, uh, you know uh, mining etc etc those sectors contribute you know this is this is my uh, passion this is my interest this is my mm-hmm. expertise mm-hmm. i don't look at uh, you know individual personalities and uh, you know uh, mm-hmm. um, quite often uh, you see it is being pointed out that uh, what really adds to the strength of uh, modi and his party is the absence of a strong opposition we are repeatedly being told that uh, there is no alternative the tina factor but do you think that uh, the scenario is getting changed uh, with the formation of the alliance of the opposition parties which is called uh, india india you see john i pointed out in my book itself that the opposition today is knock need it's not able to stand firmly it, it is knees are very weak um i'm not going into you know tina factor there is no alternative you know many a time in uh, the history uh, without alternatives alternatives have come we do not know right you know but so you the, have seen you know you have seen the formation of janata party you have seen the movement led by jay prakash narayan and the way indira rishim was uh, you know defeated 
So do you think that uh, the same kind of a churning so, is taking place? Uh, I won't be surprised. You see, for instance, if, if somebody had asked, uh, uh, even in, in 2004, who was the alternative to a giant-like personality called Atal Bihari Vajpayee? Nobody could have pointed out. But the, people will, will decide, people will, uh, you know, uh, come out and, uh, and, 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 and tell us what, what the alternative is. But I think one, one crucial difference, uh, you know, uh, between uh, the period of Indira or the period of uh, Vajpayee uh, with this uh, the contemporary day is that uh, uh, both Indira and uh, of course Vajpayee had uh, the, the ideological background, but it is not as strong as it is today. The kind of polarization that has taken place uh, in India it was not there during the time of Vajpayee and uh, Indira. And Indira Gandhi, of course, uh, she was never having the backup of such an ideological force. She led on her own. But now, Prime Minister Modi and BJP have the support of the platform, a platform like uh, RSS and uh, the Hindutva ideology. Um. Johnny, I don't dispute what you've just said. And I also know, as well as you do, that no two situations are identical. And history doesn't repeat itself. Mm -hmm. That's what people say. Mm -hmm. Or somebody says that history repeats itself. But, you know, not in an identical way. Mm -hmm. Somebody had said that, you know, history re doesn't repeat. But it rhymes. Mm -hmm. um, so much so that we don't know how the situation is different. Mm -hmm. And I myself say that, you know, the present dispensation is pretty strong. Yeah. But it is not invincible. It is very strong, but it is not undefeatable. Okay. It's not. But it's, it's difficult to take on the present regime. Mm -hmm. But, Johnny, my concern is not just an election. Okay. Although, defeat of this regime in an election makes things much easier. Mm -hmm. But, defeat of this regime in an election is not the end of the story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the poison of divisiveness, the poison of communalism, the poison of othering has gone so deep into the civil society mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that in my reckoning, it might take even a decade or two, if not more, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to take that poison out of the minds of people, mm -hmm. very unconsciously, very unconsciously, people have been communalized, mm -hmm. radicalized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, if a ruling party claiming to be the largest political party, not only in India, but in the entire world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. doesn't reflect the social reality of India. Mm -hmm. I elaborate what I mean by this. India ha is a multi-religious country. Okay. But the ruling party today does not have a, a single member of parliament, either in the upper house or in the lower house, from one of the largest minorities in this country, the Muslim minority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is the first ever time that the Union Council of Ministers doesn't have a member belonging to the largest minority in India. In UP, which again has, yeah, you know, right. houses, uh, yes. you know, uh, uh, the, the, the largest majority is, right. is very, very, very prominently present there. Yeah. The, the ruling party has not given a single ticket right. 
to the Muslim minority. Yes. In Gujarat, it is not. Right. The recently concluded Karnataka elections, not a single person yeah. was given a ticket. What does it mean? Yeah, in a recent article, I think uh, a senior journalist uh, with the Hindu, uh, he pointed out that uh, to be a Muslim in the new India is to be voiceless. So, is it okay to create that kind of a feeling in a, in a country like India? Is it okay to say that this country belongs to only a particular religion? People mm -hmm. who, 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 who belong to a particular religion. Is it, is it okay to do that? So, that is the kind of... Uh, and when, when this happens, People don't really powerfully question this. People don't really powerfully punish this kind of a, a narrative. Question this kind of a narrative. Punish those people who are holding on to this narrative. Right. Now, that is the kind of, you know, communalization that has taken place. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to change this, just one, I'm not looking at one election. It takes a decade and a half, probably two decades to to, you know, excise this kind of a thing from the minds of the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, it needs a huge amount of work that is not directly related to electoral politics and political parties. Right. I think a lot of burden, mm -hmm. a lot of responsibility for this work will have to be mm -hmm, taken mm -hmm. up by the civil society organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, in this context, I think I would uh, like to come back to your book uh, again and uh, uh, caught, uh, you know, uh, you have quoted uh, what uh, Nina Poblasova, a Muscovite, said about Stalin. Uh, she was speaking about Stalin and uh, you have quoted it, you know, in the chapter, a pandemic logbook 2021. So, these are the words. <clears throat> He stands in the balcony and he lies. Everyone claps. But everyone knows he lies. And he knows we know. But he continues spewing lies. And he is happy that everyone is applauding him. And of course we understand that uh, whom you are referring to in, the, in, in contemporary India. Does it, does it remind you of any, any situation in India? That's exactly what I mean. It, it reminds me of what is happening in India. You know, the, the kind of... And in uh, such a scenario, my question is this. In such a scenario, where everyone knows that he is lying, and he knows that they are clapping even though they know it, that he is lying. But in spite of all that, he is still the most preferred choice. So, what, what's your take on that? How do you look at it? You know, you, you have seen, I mean, history is replete with that. And does India, the alliance, uh, stand any, any chance against uh, such a phenomenon? Yeah, you see, history is replete with that, those kind of examples. And you have also known uh, the, the, the fate of uh, uh, such scenarios. What happened? What happened to Stalin? What happened to Hitler? Well, I am not exactly referring to such names. But, you know, history has shown that, you know, somebody who is very popular today may not be popular tomorrow. Somebody who is not uh, very unpopular today may be very popular tomorrow. We do not know how, how things are. But the point is this. I mean, uh, uh, leaders might come, leader might go away, leader might get elected, leader might get defeated. All these things we have seen, you have seen, I have seen and many people have seen. The point is this. What is the idea of India? Yeah. You know, I, I want the current dispensation to espouse the idea of India. I have nothing against anybody. Um, but if you are working against the idea of India, to me, idea of India is enshrined in the constitution. And our constitution has been written after a wonderful debate, very rich debate, a very thoroughgoing debate in our constituent assembly. Each and every clause was debated 
dissected, discussed with tolerance. You know, uh, we have almost every religion that is on the face of the earth is here in this country. We have so many castes, we have so many religions, we have so many diverse opinions. You can't impose a uniformity on this and say mm -hmm. everybody will have to, you know, confirm to this and, and start quoting, you know, uh, some vague uh, hoary past and say that, you know, we used to be like that. No. Mm -hmm. the, the country has changed, the world has changed, many things have taken place in this country. So many people have come here, made their home. They can't be treated as second class citizens. Today, what qualifies you and me to live in this country is citizenship. Not your religion, not your caste, not your language, not your region, not your political ideology. Right. Nothing of that sort. You are a citizen of India. And you are a citizen of India and without any of these other qualifications. You are a citizen of India, but a Hindu citizen of India, Muslim citizen of India, Christian citizen of India, uh, Malayali citizen of India, Telugu citizen. No. Citizen of India is citizen of India. I want that to be respected. I want that to have the primacy in our public life. You can go and, you know, you can worship whomever you want to worship. Right. I can go home and worship whomever I want to worship. That's my business. Yes, yes, yes. But if you start saying that only people who worship, you know, the following gods have a primacy of place and those who, who don't worship these gods and worship anybody else, they can stay here, but they have to be second class citizens. I think that goes against the grain of our constitution. Right. I think we need to look at that to, to reinstate that kind of a value system, mm -hmm. to rescue that kind of a value system from going away from our public life, from our collective life. That's more important. You know, we have seen so many leaders, we will see so many leaders. Right. You referred to uh, uniformity. So these slogans, you know, raised by uh, BJP these days, uh, uh, uniform civil code, uh, one nation, one election, uh, uh, India versus Bharat. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, the present regime is really serious about these issues or are they just uh, diversionary tactics? I do not know what, what is there in their minds. But if they are really serious about it, then I think that's going to be a very, very um, damaging to our social fabric, to our polit political unity, to our federal structure, to our unity as people. Uh, I think those things should be avoided. Uh, in India is not that. You know, if you want to make India a mirror image of Pakistan, a mirror image of Israel. I think that's very, very uncalled for, mm -hmm. unsuitable for India, unsuitable for the genius of India. And you know, we, we can't go on quoting partially. For instance, even G20, you know, the, uh, the logo has this, Vasudhaiva uh, Kutumbakam. Yeah. But I think uh, China objected to it. Huh? You see, it's like this. You have this in Atharva Veda. It says, I am Nijaha. Paro Veti. This, to, 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 to feel that these people are mine and those people are others.
this is laghu chetasam hmm this is for of the people who have narrow minds udara charitanam vasudhaiva kutumbakam for people who feel who are liberal large hearted of liberal character hmm hmm udara charitanam vasudhaiva kutumbakam for those who have large hearts and liberal minds <coughs> for them the entire world is one family for those with narrow minds they feel i am nijaha pareva iti these are my people those are not my people they are para others mm-hmm. this is of laghu chetasa this this is the feeling of people with small minds yes um since uh, we are in kerala i think i should draw your attention to the kerala model of development i don't know if you have uh, closely looked into uh, the the um, theory of uh, kerala model of development uh, but of course i think you might have some impressions about it could you could you please tell us well what i uh, am familiar with is education literacy <coughs> health services and communal amity the public services you know government providing access to you know libraries and you know roads <coughs> and you know, all the public goods is very good in kerala and this is just not by accident i think this is because of the very enlightened population enlightened leadership for a long time and enlightened and active social movements starting even before vaigom satyagraha yes. and even before that of course you know people like narayan guru yeah. you know ayyengali oh, ah. yeah and those uh, movements even adi shankara you know going back to you know those days so this this society has shown to the world that you don't have to become like america in order to give the basic health and education to your people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and food security health security law and order communal amity you know you you have uh, islam here you have christianity here you have christianity here even before europe became christian so that kind of a model i i i think the the, the rest of india will have to very closely look at it mm-hmm. and and in this context since you raised it let's not uh, you know get carried away by what you hear of the propaganda of gujarat model mm-hmm, mm-hmm. let us closely look at what is kerala model why kerala is peaceful why kerala is prosperous you know in spite of change of government certain things are untouched yeah in kerala so you are you are placing kerala model above the gujarat model and uh, you are making it very clear that uh, the whole of india has to look into kerala model more and more but there is a criticism against uh, the kerala model of development the chief the main criticism is that it failed to generate enough employment uh, for the people of kerala the the absence of entrepreneurship in kerala the absence of uh, women empowerment i mean uh, the women presence uh, in administration uh, in 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 the uh, other apparatus of uh, the executive and also the women representation in uh, the legislature women representation in the high courts so these are some of the criticisms leveled against uh, the kerala model of development johnny on this planet nothing is perfect you need to you know uh, uh, improvise you need to you know uh, correct things as you go along but i can say this much 
if somebody says that kerala people are not entrepreneurial it cannot be far it, it cannot be any farther from truth if somebody tells me that kerala women are not assertive are not independent are not um, uh, do not have uh, leadership qualities i i just cannot agree because i I've, I've, i've i've seen this society i've known kerala people for a long time that's very far from truth truth you see are women respected or not in fact correct me if i'm wrong kerala also had a tradition of matriarchy yeah um empowerment of women in kerala is is much higher compared to many other states well if somebody a uh, very serious academic says that it has to be improved well i am i am for it but i am not here to you know uh, by this argument that kerala women are backward you know they are suppressed and they are looked down upon they are not given equal opportunities kerala people are less entrepreneurial than any other i am not going to you know i am not willing to uh, buy that kind of an argument see uh, there are many dark clouds uh, over india these days and you have uh, raised your concerns uh, pretty well in your book but amidst all these amidst all these grim realities there should be something that uh, still um, keeps you optimistic and you are optimistic about the future of india so could you please tell me what are those elements what are those factors that make you optimistic amidst all these grim dark realities history tells us that uh, this land it might it might look quiet but beneath the surface uh, there's so much of churning that takes place that explodes and any idea or any regime however forceful however powerful it might seem if it goes against the grain of this land this land doesn't tolerate that it might take a little while it might you know it might also give lessons here and there and given opportunity for any collection of people who would like to sabotage that who would like to you know um, uh, who would like to subvert that kind of a thing but if they don't correct they'll be thrown out so apart from economics uh, you have some other passions too could you please uh, uh, tell me which are those passions i do i like music Okay. I like uh, chess. Music. Uh, I like Carnatic music. Carnatic music. Yes. Okay. But of course, I like all sorts of music. Right, I like right, from right. jazz to you know pop to Western music, Western classical, Hindustani classical, Carnatic classical. I I listen to all. Uh, right. And and uh, uh, the uh, film songs. Uh, film songs too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right, right, I right. do that. And you have any favorite uh, musicians uh, in the in that genre? The, for example, uh, do you do you follow Rahman? Uh, ilai raja or keeravani of course yeah. of course i do i do i do i like right. all of them um i also started learning uh, flute Kanada, flute Kanada yeah yeah flute. yeah i i i'm i am an amateur uh-huh. but uh, i i practice I, you started learning it recently or uh, uh, for the last 2 uh, 3 th- years yes oh wonderful uh, uh-huh. okay and then i play chess any any gurus you have any guru Uh, to teach not, you not a <laughs> prominent person but <laughs> right, right. you know he is also uh, very passionate the person who is teaching me mm-hmm. he is a scientist right he is a chemist oh right right uh, he works in uh, um, pharmaceutical industry mm-hmm. but he has a tremendous passion for uh, music food. and and he he doesn't take you know uh, classes and he doesn't take students just like that uh-huh. unless you prove that you are very interested and dedicated and you know right uh, you have the passion for music he he doesn't entertain and you would like to unwind uh, listening to music i do yes right and i i i read i i also have a passion for languages okay okay i, I learned languages i learned 
a bit of French. I learned a bit of Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I read a lot of Telugu. But that's my mother. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, English. And you you read a lot of non-fiction or fiction? Non-fiction, of course, I have to read because of yeah. you know my uh, interest in economics and right. uh, political economy, politics, and you know my profession. I'm into data analytics and data science and all that. But I read a, a lot of fiction. Fiction, okay. Yeah, both uh, European authors, American uh -huh, authors, uh -huh. French authors, Indian uh -huh. authors. You know, uh -huh. I, I read a lot of them. Any 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 favorite author you would like to mention? Uh, an author who has influenced you uh, a well, lot? Uh, I like I mean, these these days. I'm reading a lot of uh, Amitabh Ghosh. Oh, Amitabh Ghosh. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so he's uh, one writer from India who fascinates you. Ah, he's very fascinating. Yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh, he, uh -huh. he he gives me. And then of course uh, among the French writers, I, I like uh, Marcel Proust and. Uh, people okay, like okay, that. okay, uh, okay, okay. Um, and you know the 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 older generation of. Uh, Somerset Mom and oh, uh, right. know, people like that, uh -huh, Hardy, uh -huh. okay. uh, all those. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, then of course, I read a lot of Telugu literature. I'm interested in Telugu literature. Right, right, right. Both uh, the classical literature as well as the modern prose literature. Mm -hmm. Both poetry as well as prose. Right, I, I okay. That. And I also hear that uh, you play chess. Uh, I do, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I do. Uh -huh. And I, I sometimes write, I do write too. Right, right. And, uh, who is your favorite chess player? Chess player? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I I've been uh, because my father taught me chess. Oh, oh, okay. So okay, from okay. his generation onwards, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there've been uh, a lot of uh, you know when I started looking at uh, on my own. Um, that time it was uh, Bobby Fischer and other people, and uh, before that, you know, so many mm -hmm. Boris Spassky, those people. And, uh, and uh, during your days in JNU and uh, your days in London School of Economics, there too you pursued uh, this passion of playing chess. Yes, I did. I did. Uh -huh, I did. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, well, uh, during my student days, um, I used to play tennis. Right. And I used to indoor game is is uh, chess, um, and you know for uh, people who have interest in chess, it's very not easy to find a, a chess playing companion, you know, a partner. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So not many people are interested in chess. Right. So right. when you find somebody, you know, when you when you're playing, uh, you know, both the sides. You start playing, and then somebody looks at it and and, and, and comes and joins, and he starts moving the uh, pieces. You feel so excited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that happens because otherwise you wouldn't know who is who is interested in chess. Right, 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 right. right. Uh, and uh, these, so, these, these, these 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 things, and of course, you know, when once you have uh, a passion for chess, um, you tend to look at. Uh, what are the games that are going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. those days, Hindu used to publish, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the games, and then the entire uh, uh, how all the moves, and then uh, also give you a, a problem to solve. Right, right. Uh, okay. Probably they still do. I do not know, uh -huh, but they uh -huh. used to. We used to follow that, and used to cut those things and keep them. Right. I key, I used to keep uh, a lot of games, and of course, books used to come. Those days, during the Soviet days, Soviet Union used to produce a huge amount of uh, books on chess. Um, how to end a game, the end game, because end game is very complicated. And there they, they were theses and books devoted to just end game. Right. And, you know, I, I, I have a book uh, which describes about 248 end game moves and then there are books on middle game and there are many many books on openings right. itself you know variety of openings and um, how, what is your first move what should be your first move and then what should be the blacks first move why right, right. first move is this what's the blacks first move? you know all this i think uh, um, i i hope you don't mind it um, just go to some friends also was uh, nirmala ji one of them no in your, in your uh, JNU days? No. Right, right. Uh, she doesn't play chess, is it so? No. Right, right, right. Okay.
Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Prakar. Thank you.